Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today I will be interviewing a great character actress who goes all the way back to the 80s. Her name is Kate McGregor Stewart. You may remember her. She was the censor in the classic Christmas movie Scrooged. And I'm having her on the show today. We're going to talk about the 30th anniversary of that movie, as well as some of the others she was in. She was in the Adams Family movie, Father of the Bride, um, A Midsummer Night Sex Comedy, and many others. And it's going to be pretty cool. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while now, about a month as to as to be exact. So, uh, yeah. Hey, Kate, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I am great. Oh, it's such an honor. Thank you for taking the time this morning. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's funny to go so far back because uh, I got this job. It was I did the very first job or the second job I got when I moved here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I moved with my daughter, who had just turned four, in September. And I think we moved on, like, the 9th of September or something. So I was utterly unacclimated, didn't really know anything. I had an agent because I was looking jobs in New York for that agency. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd never met the L.A. agent, and I'd never lived in L.A. So it was a big, exciting, intimidating shift. And um, I remember that the two... The two auditions I got first, and I don't know what the order was, was I got um, I got an audition for Bob Newhart's uh, Halloween episode, and I booked that, and then I was very encouraged, and then I got an audition for this movie called Scrooge, mm-hmm. and I remember because I took my daughter with me, and she's a very well-behaved baby, and well, a little girl, you know, before, and um, was always very happy to make friends with anyone around. So we went to, I can't remember what lot it was. I might have been filming, but anyway, do you know who we made the movie? Uh, Paramount. It was Paramount, yeah. So um, we were chatting with the secretary, and, and I got called in. The secretary said, oh, Roger, no problem. And I said, oh, thank you so much. I said, I'll be right back, sweetie. For some reason, she just started to howl, which she never did. So the whole long walk down the corridor and around the corner to the audition room, I heard my daughter howling, and I thought, oh, my God. And when I got in there, I was practically in a flop sweat over it. So I had this vaguely glazed sensation while I was doing the audition, Mm because I was trying to block out the sound of my child wailing and focus and listen and take an audition. And uh, Dick Donner was so nice. Oh, gosh, so nice to me. You know, they did a couple things twice. And finally I left and I thought, oh, my God, that was mortifying. (laughs) And I got home. And that was in September, -September. Mm mid-September. So my agent calls me in January and says, you booked Scrooge. I said, "I, I what? They said, you booked Scrooge. And I said, I said, what is Scrooge? They said, it's, it's a movie that you auditioned for. And I said, uh, I think it's a mistake. I don't think it's me. And they said, no, no, it's you. I said, well, I, I don't know what movie that is. What, what? I mean, it was four months later. And I had been in such a, a sweat trying to get through the audition that I had completely blocked it. And they had to convince me that there was a job, and I had auditioned for it, and I was going to shoot it. So it was a very funny beginning. You know, it's just beginning to a very happy job. That's that's show business. You learned about Hollywood pretty quick. Uh, Before we get further into Scrooge, though, I wanted to go back um, a, a little bit. Oh, by the way, I wanted to ask you, are you easily offended? Oh, good, because I, I like to swear on the show. <laughs> well, remember, I yell shit in the movie, so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes. we, I'm off to a good start. <laughs> I, 
I, I, I knew you, you you had that dark Irish side to you. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, did, so did you know... You have to go a long way to offend me. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. We'll get along great. Um, did you know growing up that you wanted to act? Yes, I wanted to act really right from the beginning. Did you idolize... I didn't, any- I didn't, I didn't uh, conceptualize it as a career. I just was always acting. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I mean, it's funny. I saw it in my daughter when she was at, in a nursery school production of some sort of Columbus Day thing, and I went over and it was, you know, all the children in a line saying, you know, in in wow, and what, sixteen hundred and forty-two, whatever it was, uh-huh. Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and all the children were supposed to put their hands up on their foreheads like they're looking at the horizon, you know. Mm-hmm. And they all sort of stuck their hands up there and kept reciting. And my daughter brought her hand up and leaned forward and looked way out across the ocean. <laughs> Everybody said, I said, well, you know who's the acting child? <laughs> and yet it's been that way for her, too. It's just like sometimes when you have that bug, you're just born with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, did, uh, did you idolize any movie stars? I know, it's, it's one of my favorite questions I like to ask. I don't remember. I know who I idolize now, but I don't know. I, I remember one of the first movies that I saw that blew me out of the water was Imitation of Life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I saw it so hard, I, I had to stay in the seat for about five minutes when the movie was over. I couldn't get up and walk out or anything. And, of course, I saw... Things when I was younger, I saw uh, live performances of the HMS Pinafore, the the, the company, a doily cart, I think is the name, who did those, and those were British, and I was very involved. I freaked completely out during um, mm, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz when the witch, the witch scared me to death, and I just had very dramatic reactions to things because I was personalizing everything. I didn't observe as a child. I I tried on. And it, it went really right through everything because I do remember being broken one Saturday when I, I woke up. I was devastated and felt just wiped out. And I kept thinking, why do I feel so terrible? <laughs> I remembered that the night before I had read in Gone with the Wind the reports of who had been killed in the war. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I had personalized it so much that literally I woke up on Saturday morning feeling completely depressed. So that's kind of the things that actors do. They they don't just watch a movie. They are the movie. Or they take it in like, oh, my God, if that was me. I still do that. I still um, feel just utterly devastated for every parent of every uh, child that is being brought to the border. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, anything like that. And when there's starvation in countries and um, like the hinges that are being run out of their land and they they have to travel on foot to some other country and across water in boats that don't hold them and whole boats and families and villages drown. Those things wipe me out. And I think lots of people have empathy for that and feel terrible about it. But for me, it's devastating because I can't keep it out of my whole being. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, what, so where did you train for acting? Where did I train, did you say? Uh-huh. Yeah, like, uh, did, did you yeah. go? Yeah, I, I went to Yale School of Drama. Mm-hmm. And did, uh, when you came back to New York, did you do Broadway plays? Yeah, I did. I did four. Wow. Over a period of... Uh, what happened was I went late to Yale because uh, the first time I tried to get into Yale, I didn't get in, which was uh, right after college. I must have been like 21. I didn't know what I was doing either. But um, 
I did not get in, and so I started, I, I, I was an English major, everything that interested me to work at began with a P, it seemed, personnel, <laughs> publishing, uh, public relations, anything that sounded appealing to me was a P word, and I ended up getting into um, personnel, hiring and firing uh, people for jobs at the University of Pennsylvania. And then I got another job after that in New York, right down near Wall Street at Pace College. The, the first one was just being one of the interviewers. The second one, I was the, there were only two people in the office, the woman who ran it, and then I was the second in command, so I had a lot more to do um, in that job. And then I ended up uh, getting married to someone who was going to Yale University, Yale School of Drama. So... I worked again in personnel at the Fairfield University to support us. And then while I was there, I was always auditioning for plays and stuff because he was in the drama department. And I did some of his plays and some of his friends' plays. And finally, I got a little note from the uh, drama department that said, you know, how wonderful they thought I had been in this particular uh, annual Beckett play. And... Um, they said a few compliments, and then they said, we do wish you were at the school. And my husband said, well, I think that's an invitation. And I said, well, how would we live <laughs> if we were both in the school? We wouldn't, we wouldn't be. And he said, I, I think you should apply anyway. So I asked for an application form, and they said, you don't have to do a contemporary piece because we've seen you do many contemporary performances that were excellent. So I put together a Shakespeare piece, and then they took me. But they gave us a lot of uh, scholarship and um, I forgot what they called it at the time when they gave a work study where you had, you know, they would give you a job. And I worked in the, um, the, the switchboard uh, part time. Mm -hmm. And we got through. So, and by that time, my husband was getting out and got a really good job at NYU. So uh, we were all right. But um, it was kind of a wild time. And then I went through three years there, and it was rough. Uh, Sigourney Weaver was in my class, mm -hmm. and Meryl was the class behind me. Mm -hmm. I, I did a summer stock season with Meryl, and uh, so we became close. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I, they, they were hard. They were so hard on Sigourney. It was crazy. They kept bugging her about her dress. She was uh, just kind of a, a slacker dresser. You know, you see with two string pants and then a wrinkled shirt or something. She just wasn't much into worrying about her wardrobe or anything. But we were in drama school as students. Come on. It wasn't a requirement to have a uniform or anything. And they kept saying, you're so beautiful. You need to dress you know, dressed to your looks and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, finally, we graduated, and to my utter shock, they hired me for the rep company. So wow. when I went to New York, I had both the MFA and the year of professional experience, so that was miraculous. Um, and then I went to New York. And uh, my first, job was with the Royal Shakespeare Company in Tom Stoppard's Travesty, mm -hmm. which was scary. <laughs> it was a scary show. <laughs> it was a little hard, and of course, everyone there was British. Mm -hmm. um, what happened was they had an entirely American cast, of course, as understudies, and uh, we were rehearsing in a, in a rehearsal hall. And there was tape on the floor that said, okay, this is the entrance to the library. This, these marks are the stairs going up. But it was really just a big empty room with tape on the floor. Wow. And um, so when they came and started putting the show into the theater, um, we would sit in the house and watch the rehearsals. But now there, were real, there was real furniture, real doors, real steps and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, they put in for a week, and then they opened on, uh, I think, a Thursday or Friday, and Saturday morning they called, and 
and said, Meg is, uh, uh, Beth is sick. And I said, what? They said, Beth is sick, so you're going to be doing the, the, the matinee and the evening show for Saturday and probably through the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> My blood ran cold. I had never walked on the set. I would be looking at actors I'd never looked at. Yeah. I knew the lines, thank God. But, you know, you don't know if you know the lines if you've never run the play. We we would run it ourselves in the rehearsal hall, but it was sort of like a mock-up. Oh, my God. Yeah, I've been... I mean, I was in the dressing room. I mean, I literally ran to a drugstore, bought some makeup and a pair of stockings, and then ran to the theater. And everything is, he just wanted to skip town. And I'm not that kind of person, but I was like... Oh, no, 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 I can't, I can't, I don't, I don't, I, blah, blah. and I thought, just put one foot in front of the other, put your makeup on, put your stockings on, wear the dress, and, um, and I got through it. <laughs> so that was kind of an amazing thing, and the other weird thing that happened is that I, of course, was at survival, absolute survival, and, and my husband went to the matinee, he said, you were wonderful. The only thing is, I couldn't always hear you really well, and I was way up in the balcony. Now, I have a very loud projecting voice, <laughs> even in life. And yeah. I said, you couldn't hear me? He said, well, I could hear you, but I had to work a little bit. And I thought, wow, that's what happens when you're not sure that what you're saying is what you're supposed to be saying. You get a little bit of timidity in it. So... I went home, took a bath by candlelight, and then went back and did the second show, and of course it was fine, and then I did two more on Sunday. Wow. Oh my God, what a terrifying feeling. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, oh, I, I just wanted to get on a bus and leave forever. So that was my introduction to Broadway. That was my first one, and then later on, I, had, I went on for the second, the other girl, um, because I was understudying the two girls. And uh, they, they were here for 20 weeks, so I got quite a few performances in. And, and it was really good training, you know, and a really great uh, credit. I remember being weirded out because in New York, when you go for an open call, which is what they call it when they're mm -hmm. auditioning for something, you know, the line goes around the block twice. And this time, there was no line. And I thought, am I in the right place? I went in and there was a, a like a ladies' lounge and there might have been I don't know eight actresses. Mm -hmm. And I thought this is odd. But then later someone said, well, the, the requirements were so stringent. You had to have you know, professional training. You had to be completely confident with an English accent. You had to know style. You had to know all these things. And I guess there weren't a lot of people who could answer that. So that was really. <laughs> an amazing experience and that gave me a lot of confidence going forward you know yeah yeah I, I've the been... other three shows were let's see it was travesties um there was grown-ups Jules Pfeiffer's grown-ups mm -hmm. there was um oh oh uh Beyond Therapy was a big one Oh yeah, the Robert Altman uh, adaptation he did. He later did. Yeah. Oh, it was a terrible adaptation. It was a terrible adaptation. It wasn't even terribly funny. I was really kind of horrified, and it was one of my idols. Um, what's her name that did the lead in it? Oh, uh, Julie Haggerty. What? No, no, no. She played uh, Sigourney Weaver's role, but I'm talking about the therapist. Oh. Jackson, Glenda Jackson. Oh, okay. Yeah. Whom I, whom I really thought was a marvelous actress, but she wasn't very funny in that. I thought that it was the adaptation's fault, or maybe Altman's fault, because it just wasn't funny. And on Broadway, it was side splitting. But yeah. Frank Rich, Frank Rich rang our death now. He did not like Christopher Durang ever. Yeah. He gave him a hard time. It took him a long time to get past that. You know, it took Chris a long time to get past that bias to where people were getting him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've interviewed a lot of actors who were in New York in the 70s, and they've all told me just what a magical time it was because, you know, you could 
you know, go to these these amazing acting classes and go on auditions and go to the actor studio and work out your craft. It was just like magic. It was a great time. It really was. Oh, that's what the other uh, the other show was also a Chris show called History of American Film. It was kind of a musical, mm-hmm. uh, literally the history of American film. Um, so it was those two Durang shows and the and the Shakespeare Company and then um, Jules Pfeiffer's. Nice. And uh, one of your first movies, you were in uh, Woody Allen's A Midsummer Sex Comedy, Midsummer Night yeah, Sex I, Comedy. I was. That was that shot in New York, or at least I auditioned in New York. Yeah. Um, that was fun because I had been in a play at Yale at the Rep Company with Tony uh, Roberts, and then he was in the in the movie with me. So that was really really fun. Mm-hmm. Just to have that carry over, you know. Yeah, I heard. I heard Woody doesn't communicate with his actors much. No, he, even the audition was weird. I mean, <laughs> he wasn't rude or anything, but he just sort of observed. And I mean, I thought I hadn't done very well. You know, usually a director does interact. With, they either make suggestions or acknowledge or change something, and and he didn't. So I thought, oh well, that was a bust. And then I got it. <laughs> You never know this business. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is a, a selfish moment for me because I'm a huge horror fan and this show is generally focused on horror. But you did two episodes of Tales from the Dark Side. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, can't remember. I can't believe you remember that. Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. I did um, Grandma's Last Wish, which was really wild and fun because I, um, we all had to age in it. Mm-hmm. The, the wish, the wish we all had was that we could put Grandma in a home and not be so burdened. And they get somehow I can't remember the storyline, but she got a wish, and her wish was that we would all be as old as her and understand it. So all of us had to have prosthetic face masks made with us as old people. It was really wild. And the other one was about Hallie's comet. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't remember much about it, honestly. Yeah, it, uh, you worked with Warner Shook. He directed them. And oh, yeah, Warner. Mm. A couple weeks ago, I interviewed John Amplis, who was in a lot of the George Romero movies with him. And I asked him, I said, oh. is, that, is that guy still alive? And he's like, he is, but he's MIA. Nobody knows where Warner Shook is. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because I saw him in the movie. He was a really good friend for a while. Yeah, I saw him in the movie Creep Show, and he played a, a flamboyantly gay guy in it. Creep Show, don't know Creep Show, but I, I'm not much of a horror movie person, so if it's horror movies, I don't know something. But <coughs> yeah. <coughs> what was, what? I mean, I'm, in, I'm inhaling a muffin. Wait one second. <laughs> Okay. with uh, Fritz Weaver? With who? Fritz Weaver. Uh, in what? He was in the um, the Haley's Comet episode. No, I remember 
I can get it though. Especially when you're a character actor. Mm-hmm. You know. And well, I, really, if you're anything but a star. Uh, and I love character actors, because they're just, you know, they, they really are journeymen. Mm-hmm. I think, I think people who are character actors are lucky, <clears throat> because the jobs are more interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, Comet Watch. I got it right here. Let's see, Anthony Heald. Yeah, that's who I was trying to think of. Yeah. Because afterwards I would see him in all kinds of things. I'd think, oh, there he is. And the same thing would happen, like, there were a lot of people in um, History of American Film, that other Durang show. And you see them all over. <laughs> you know, they're scattered in all kinds of things. It's kind of fun to watch people. And then I also watch people turning up that I knew from drama school. Mm-hmm. That's kind of nice, because you think, oh, good, we got work, and oh, he's still out there. And <laughs> you know, it's sort of one of the things about being an actor is you you really don't forget the people you were working in the thing with. I mean, largely, every now and again, you meet someone and you think, oh, God, what's their name, what's their name? <laughs> but not usually, not if it's anybody who, <clears throat> you know, who had a, a character in a show of a real character. Mm-hmm. Do you have any memories of Critical Condition? Critical Condition. Uh, remind me what the movie's about. Uh, Richard Pryor is a con artist uh, who goes to this hospital and pretends to be a doctor, and you're Nurse Mary. Yeah, that was the that funny. was. That's funny. There's another one I barely remember too, where I played uh, some kind of a newspaper journalist. <clears throat> um, I couldn't even tell you what it is. Honestly, sometimes uh, someone will reference something, and I'll think. I, I actually told somebody who said they remembered loving me in an episode of Kate and Alley, and I said, <laughs> oh, "No, that wasn't me." And they said. Are you sure? And I said, yeah, I was not Kate and Alley. And they said, I'm pretty sure it was you. And I said, well, I don't think so. And a long time later, I got a residual for like $12.13 from Kate and Alley. And I was like, oh, my God. I don't even know. I mean, it must have been like a short scene. Yeah. You know, where I, I breathed in and said something and left. But I had no recollection of it. None. And that's really unusual because I can go pretty far back and remember details from even driver school. But it's like there's so much, and you're you're moving through so many things. I mean, I don't know how many movies I command, but over twenty. Mhm. That journalist. You know. That journalist character that was in Hello Again. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs>
Mm-hmm. But he was having trouble that day, you know, and yeah. that's just the way it is sometimes. Young <laughs> actors have trouble sometimes, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Critical condition. So it was in a hospital. Yeah, and it also had... the. Um... remember going to a hospital. But I don't even remember what the movie was about. <laughs> yeah, he's a con artist who who was supposed to go to this like program um, because he got caught uh, stealing again. And instead he ends up um, pretending to be this, this doctor who's, who already exists in this other hospital. And like, he's doing uh, all these crazy things and stuff. And Rachel Ticotin is his like love interest. And also Joe Mantegna is there. And Bob Saget is there. I must've done a, like a walk on of a couple of lines. Yeah, you you just play the nurse in it. I haven't seen it in a long time myself. Yeah, because I mean, usually if I play a whole scene, I mean, I played one little scene in um, the Adams Family. <laughs> the State of the Cross. Time, Love that. Uh, uh, Angelica Houston. Yeah. Who <laughs> <laughs> was so intimidating and beautiful and and um, kind of elegant. Yeah. And the light. Burned out. One of the lights burned out above us, you know, one of our spots. And somebody had to come in on a ladder and change it. And so we were just sitting there. And it was really kind of profound because we had had a little bit of chit chat, of course. Yeah. But there was nothing going on except this guy on a ladder above us. And we were just smiling at each other and we just stayed. We just looked at each other pretty much nonstop for five minutes. We were like just being there. It was so profound and so like grounding for the scene, you know. I was like, "Wow, well, she'll never forget me, and I'll never forget her." And it was it was just we had done our chit chat. We had nothing more we needed to say, mm-hmm. so we just didn't talk. We just existed together in the in the office set. Yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, that scene is hilarious. Just your reaction to her saying, "Not anymore." <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it's classic I love that scene and I was also surprised when I saw the movie and saw that everything was all dark and gloomy and they put me in a hot pink suit <laughs> <laughs> well they gotta show the contrast between her you know creepy darkness and oh, you no. you being a normal person <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my God! You're in the fifth world. You get a job. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so, okay. So, Scrooge, you um, you said you got to L.A. That was like one of your first jobs there, and you get the part, and uh, you get to play this lady censor, and. Did you, so did you know right away that you were going to be like, you know, hit all, all, all these times and all that stuff? No, 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 not at all. Um, I knew the lines and I knew the, the setup, you know, mm-hmm. and um, <clears throat> it was really interesting because Dick Donner was a really great director. Yeah. He was very special. He, uh, if, if people got tired on set, or, you know, it was like getting to be 5.30 and we'd been there since 6 in the morning and stuff. Yeah. Um, we would stop shooting, stop filming, and have everybody get up and, you know, jump around and sing, which was an, ex- an absolutely marvelous way to get blood in people's veins and get them to kind of drop the hyper-focus you have when you're making a movie and Everybody, every person on the set, um, the, the lighting people, the, <clears throat> the boom operator, <laughs> the, the DP, all the actors, every single person had to jump around and dance and, and he played happy, peppy music. It was wild. I thought, this is wonderful. Because, of course, at the end of three minutes of that, everybody's renewed.
mm-hmm. is um, he said he said something he announced to us or something. He said, by the way, don't worry, a friend of mine's going to drop by and just you know hang out with me a little bit. So I, I will be paying attention to you. And we said, oh okay, I paid no attention to the whole thing. And I looked up. I was in my scene, and I think it was like between takes. So they had said cut, and we're readjusting something. And I looked up, and there was Mel Gibson. Oh my God! And right next to Dick Johnson. I was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine, he says, you know. And of course, he was friends because he'd done a bunch of stuff with him. But I was like, oh my God, Mel Gibson is sitting right there within touching distance, almost. Oh my but God! Was, you know, it was a—it's it, just typical. He was just the nicest, most actor-friendly, uh, most unstressed director. Oh my God! And that's not an easy movie to shoot. It's full of action and crowds and people and everything else, you know. And and sets and you know, it's a it's a uh, sets and bits and it's yeah, a, it's, like a ladder. Not what it, it is. It's got a TV show within a movie too. That's right. You know, it's about the you know the the, the TV industry, and um, I heard I heard Bill Murray is very prickly off stage. Prickly? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that he's chatty or or anything, but <clears throat> I had a sense of wanting to make it easy for him, but that was a big big role. He was carrying a movie, carrying the story. Mm-hmm. And, <clears throat> you know, you don't know how an actor works unless you've worked with him before and know them well. And it's a lot to hold on to if you're the lead or if you're even a big a big character in it because uh, you've got other scenes coming up. You've got a lot of lines. Mm-hmm. You're trying to be ready in the mood and the the space of the scene that's about to be shot, and then it gets shot and shot and shot and shot. <laughs> in Father of the Bride, we did a dining, a family dining table scene, mm-hmm. ninety-one times. Wow, ninety-one times. Yeah, it took all day and into the night. And oddly enough, we came back the next morning and we had a new DP. Wow. I think maybe they didn't like the lighting or something was going on that they couldn't get it the way they wanted it. And we started again the next day. I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe we're going to sit at a dining table and eat the same damn crap again. <laughs> <laughs> I learned early in my career. It, one, of, one of my very first jobs in New York was a, a series on PBS called Best of Families. Mm-hmm. And Sigourney was in that, too. And... Uh, Oh, my God. I didn't know about eating scenes, so I was trying to eat very, you know, very actively and very tastefully. <laughs> and, of course, you have to take it again and again and again and eat exactly the same thing in the same way because when they cut it together, they don't know which taste they're going to use or, you know, if you're eating one thing and then they cut back to you and you're eating something else and it hasn't been enough time, then that doesn't work. So... Uh, what I learned on that. Hello? I'm here. Oh. What I learned on that job was uh, choose something you're going to eat and eat it really slowly so that um, you don't have to eat the rest of the food. Because otherwise, if you're just eating the way you normally eat, you, you'll be so sick. Yeah. You can keep shoveling food in for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> So I learned to, like, <clears throat> start the scene with a piece of something, like, let's say, roll. I would I would have it at my mouth like I had just eaten it, and then I would put it down on the butter plate and maybe take a sip of water. Because if I had to do that over and over and over, I wasn't eating the bread. I was just finishing eating the bread. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but in, but in the best of families, I didn't know that. So I was eating voraciously and getting sick by the minute. But uh, <laughs> that was a that was an interesting PBS series and it had Scorny and it had uh, Bill Hurt and it had a lot of really good people in it. Mm-hmm. 
when you when you did um, Scrooge, though, uh, I, one thing I noticed, I mean, in a lot of your roles, you know, you have this very long, beautiful, curly red hair, but you have short hair in uh, Scrooge. Like, uh, was that something you came up with? No, I think it was their concept of her being so uptight. I believe they kind <laughs> of straightened it and put it in uh, a French twist in the back. I kind of remember the pulling it close to my head, straightened, and then twisting it up, up the back of my hair so it wouldn't be down on my neck and up at the top of my head is where the French twist would end. It made me look a little more severe, a little more critical, and a little less, well, sort of playful. You know, she was she was gumming up the works with her stuffiness. Yeah, <laughs> I just love you. I just love it every time you're about to get hit. Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you kissed John Glover. Yeah, John Glover. He wrote that in. That was not part of the script. He just liked my character and wanted me to have more of a payoff. And so that happened. Mm hmm. Is he a good kisser? I don't even remember, but I was a and I was home, so it wasn't weird. Yeah. We just, we just giggled and had a good time doing it. Yeah. I've loved this movie since I was six years old. It's one of those uh, movies I watch every Christmas. It's I think it's one of the better adaptations of the uh, Christmas Carol story. Oh, I love that. I'll know now when I'm looking at it that, that you're watching it for your yearly take. My yearly thing is the holiday. Mm-hmm. That so sappy little romance with Cameron Diaz and Kate Winslet and Jack Black and uh, um, what's his name? The, uh, can't think of his name. Who's a romantic English lead? Hugh Grant? No, that, that kind of thing. Um, what is his name? It's a very, it's a very Hugh Grant kind of movie. It's got, you know, a lot of good feels and stuff. Pierce Brosnan? No, younger than that. Uh, uh, Russell Crowe, Hugh Jackman, um, Colin Farrell. Much less assertive. Uh, I think he had a, a scandal where he had an affair with his nanny or something. Oh. God, that could be anybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, my God. Anyway, I'll probably scream it out in another five minutes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can you believe it's been 30 years since Scrooge came out? No. That's weird. Yeah. And I list every week. I, I watch Ileana Douglas's podcast, and she said that she, she's been trying to get somebody from Scrooge on her podcast forever because she loves that movie, and she, like, wants to get insight on it. And Aww. I'm Facebook friends with her sidekick on the show, and um, I... I, 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 I think for her sidekick. Her sidekick on the show. Ah, yeah. And I said, I'll, I'll give both of you a shout-out um, when, I, when I interview the censor lady on, on, on the show and stuff. Uh, so I like to it's give nice to feel that people are paying that much attention to it, but uh, I mean of course when it's a recycling Christmas movie, I have three of these. I have Father of the Bride, which recycles every Christmas. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jingle All the Way. I have a little scene in Jingle All the Way, which I never remember till people remind me. Yeah, I wanted to ask about those two. Uh, Father of the Bride, I mean, you told me that one story, but what, do you have any other memories of it? Oh, I have many memories of Father of the Bride, sure. <clears throat> that, was a, that was a long roll that ran through the movie, and then we did a second, uh, you know, Father of the Bride Part Two. So 
uh, that that is vivid in my mind, pretty much. And I don't know what would be well. One of the things that was interesting in Father the Bride, I told you about the dinner scene that went on right. for years. But um, another thing that was interesting for me to see was that uh, Steve Martin, who oh, is so clever and funny and quick, yeah, uh, the way he would handle. I had seen a lot of very clever, good comedic actors. You know, throw stuff in, ad lib, um, get an idea and try it out. And what Steve Martin did was just so respectful. He would play the scene as written a mm-hmm. number of times. Then he would say to, uh, it was Charles Shire and Nancy Meyer, and I, don't, I think it was Charles that was directing, but I'm not sure because they were both working on it together. He would say, can I try something? Mm-hmm. Or she would say yes, and then it would be something wonderful. So... I just think how respectful that was to just do it as written, do it as written, make sure he has it in the can, and then say, let me try something. And, oh, I have an idea. So he would, you know, bring out some really funny, wonderful improvisational stuff. And uh, the other thing I really loved watching was, um, oh, uh, (laughs) I can't think of his name. The one who, who was the wedding planner who mispronounced everything, you know, the cock. What, what flavor would you like the cock to be? Do you know who I'm talking about? Uh, I'm just trying to think. Oh, he's so funny. Oh, my God. Um, the, the butler is, is, is Martin Short. Yes, Martin Short. Oh, my God. He was hysterical. And he was, he was at living a lot, but of course, it was his scene. He was the one introducing them and saying, come and I'll show you this, and would you like that? So because it was his scene, it you know, wouldn't throw anybody else off if he made ad libs or came up with something, so that was easier. But, but mm-hmm. um, Steve was in, you know, group scenes a lot of times and with other people, so he just was so respectful. I thought it was lovely. And at that same time that we were shooting that, uh, a play he had written, uh, Picasso at the La Panagio, mm-hmm. was being done at the Getty. Is that what I mean? The Getty? No, not the Getty. The, uh, I'm told the Getty is the art museum. But, uh, what is the name of the theater here in town? At the... The Egyptian? No, it's right near UCLA. Oh, I can't think of it right now. But anyway, it was, it's, a. Uh, it's a stage theater mm-hmm. that has a lot of plays in it, and so I just thought, gosh, he's so versatile. Yeah, he, he's, a, he's a genius. And yeah, he is. I saw an interview that Cindy Williams did where she said that uh, she originally wanted Jack Nicholson uh, for his role, and she uh, was going to have Penny Marshall direct the movie originally. Which, which movie? Father of the Bride. Really? Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. What was it like uh, working with Cindy? Sorry, with, with who? With Cindy Williams. Cindy Williams is that the bride? She's one of the producers, you know, from the. Because Kimberly Williams was the bride. Yeah, Kimberly Williams was the bride. Cindy was one of the producers of the movie. I don't remember, honestly. It's very difficult. Uh, with producers because they're so busy. Mm-hmm. Unless, uh, I mean, when I have coached other actors, you know, and gone with them on a movie set where I'm sitting at the monitor with the producers and the director, then I get to know the producers better because they're sitting right there and we chat and, you know, they ask me things and I ask them things and we're all part of the same sort of circle there. But producers are usually not... Um, they don't insert themselves very actively in the creative happening. They're either watching it on the monitor right. and coming in and out to see what's happening, or, you know, you might meet them socially at lunch, or, you know, they'll come up and introduce themselves so you know who they are, or if they were here at the audition, mm-hmm. uh, you know. But I, I don't have a close relationship with many producers for that reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they're just 
they're frenetic, they're always busy, you know. They're so busy. I mean, if you're the lead of the film, perhaps you know them better because they're coming around to see you and asking you things, and you're involved. They're involved with you. But for me, as a, as a secondary, unless I'm the lead, you know, in Father of the Bride, I, I was certainly one of the leads, but. If, if it's something like Scrooge, where I'm just a character actor of the cast, mm-hmm. uh, and the scenes are going by so quickly, and you go from one scene to another scene, and then they have no, no bearing on each other, you know, you're just shot when you're shot, um, you, don't always, you don't always see them until, until you have a rap party or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then some, direct, some producers are very personable. And like to be like to be uh, in relationship to the cast more, and others are either money people or office people, or you know they have another kind of a relationship with their job. Yeah. Do you, Do you have any memories though of uh, Jingle All the Way? Not much. It was very quick. Mm-hmm. I, uh, it was with Schwarzenegger, and it was about trying to get a hold of a particular doll. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember <laughs> I remember the scene, but, you know, when you have one scene like that, you're in and out, so you don't have, like, a lot going on. But it's funny how many people remember me from that. Well, the first time it happened, I was with my tax accountant, and someone who was leaving from having their taxes done, uh... I said, oh, I know you. And I said, oh, uh, oh, who are you? And he told me, and it didn't ring any bell. And, and then we tried to figure out where he knew me from, and we went over and over. And said, oh, I know. I can see it in my mind's eye, and I know you, and I just can't think of from where. And I said, well, anyway, we know each other now. <laughs> <laughs> and then about, I don't know, three hours later, my tax accountant <laughs> texted me and said, he figured it out, and she sent me a little piece of Jingle All the Way, and he had been in that scene where I was tussling over the toy. Mm-hmm. Were, you on the, were you on the set with, with uh, Sinbad? I, I don't think so. He might have been around, though, because it's like we say, say Sinbad, and I have a picture other than, you know, seeing him in movies or things, you know? hmm But I don't think I had much to do with him because when you have one scene like that, you are waiting somewhere, tucked away, to be called. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's in your dressing room, maybe it's in a, a, you know, green room. And then you go, and then you shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, and they're there, and they turn around on other people, and then they do close-ups, and it's pretty intensive. You don't have a lot of free time. Mm-hmm. And unless they're moving the camera from one point of view to another point of view, then you have like a 15, 20 minute break to chit chat. Um, uh, then you go and get your makeup off and your costume off and go home. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, unless it's an ongoing role where it's going to have more scenes and more scenes, you just see each other day in, day out, you know, um, it can be pretty, pretty quick. But of course, I was doing the scene, and he was watching the scene. I don't, I don't know what he did in it, but I suspect he was one of the shoppers or something like that. Yeah. Maybe even the sales manager. So he might have been looking at me much more than I was looking at him because I was looking at the toy and looking at Schwarzenegger and trying to, you know, I had an objective as my character, which was to get that damn toy come hell and high water. So. As your character, you're playing something that's driving you, and that makes you not not very um, tuned in to everything around you. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean, if your character's tuned in, you're tuned in. If your character's playing a detective trying to find out which person in the room might be guilty, then you're looking all over at everybody and checking every little thing. But if you're a driven parent having to get that toy at all costs, then your energy is directed in one direction. Mm-hmm. Now, you've, as everybody knows, um, you know, acting is not an easy profession. You know, there's lots of rejection. There's lots of periods where uh, 
an actor doesn't work and stuff. You've been pretty consistent uh, working as an as an actor, but uh, were, were there ever years where you struggled? Oh, of course. I mean, nothing where I, I think it's the most terrifying thing is people who get very successful on, say, a TV show, mm -hmm. making really good money week to week, and then the show gets canceled, and they've gone out and bought a house. Yeah. And now they bought a house where the mortgage <clears throat> is is taken with an idea toward having those checks. Yep. So, I mean, you see so many people who have to sell their houses because they just can't also the strike stuff. I mean, there have been strikes in Hollywood since I've lived here that where people lost their homes because it, it took too long and they couldn't get the money together and they eventually had to foreclose mm -hmm. or sell. So uh, that's really scary. Whenever I felt disappointed that I hadn't booked a long-running successful series where I can have tons of money in the bank in a big house, I always thought, well, less to lose. <laughs> all it was, that terribly shaky underpinning when you're an actor. I mean, unless you're on, you know, NCIS for 10 years or something, or... You know, what's the one that that runs forever? SBU, oh, Law and Order. Law and Order has been running, I don't know, 20 years or something. Mm -hmm. But honestly, if I was on Law and Order, I would want to pull my hair out at the end of five years playing. <laughs> seeing, it's, such, it's so much pain. Any episode feels the same, practically. Yeah, I don't know how it's... Formula. Yeah, it's going on 30 years. I don't know how it survived 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, it's just, it, it's kind of the kind of person you are in the luck of the draw. It's a wonderful lucky draw to get a series that is a big hit. I mean, that's an incredible, incredible blessing. Um, and if people really love it and, and watch it, and that's a great thing. But then, you know, when that's over, you feel, I would imagine, completely rootless and completely weird, sort of hung out to dry, whereas my career which was on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. Mm -hmm. um, and in the middle of that, I was doing plays. There was a there was a play in La Jolla about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or something. And uh, my agent called said, you want to audition for this play? And I thought, play? Yes. Because <laughs> I love plays. There just aren't a lot to go on out here. Yeah. And um, I remember Terrence McNally calling me. After I moved, oh God, I've been out here two or three years. He called me and he said, when are you going to get over this, this odd fascination with the West Coast to come back to New York? <laughs> I was so flattered and so delighted. And it made me sort of a heartache because Terrence McNally material is divine. Right. And I thought, you know, New York is really busy, really crowded, really expensive. And I have a baby. I mean, by now she was, you know, eight. But... Raising a child here was so much more civilized. Being able to drive great. You know, I, there were things I missed terribly, but the life was much more livable. And um, what was I, why I interrupted myself to say that? Oh, so I got this job in La Jolla um, with Des Mackinac, who's a really great director. And it was a new play, and that was always fun. And I thought, I always was doing new material to the field. And I was trained on tons of original plays because they have a playwriting division, so we were always putting plays up that the students had written and that were brand new. And, and in order to survive mm -hmm. that show in La Jolla, which only paid everybody $600 a week or something like that, it was called Favored Nations when that happened. Everybody agrees to take the same amount. Mm -hmm. um, in order to meet my rent, and pay my bills, I had to commute home on my one day off, teach one of my classes from, I think, one to four, and the other class from, like, uh, seven to ten, and then get up at dawn the next day and commute back for my rehearsal. Wow. Yeah, it was a big wow. That's... I mean, fortunately, I love teaching, and I love acting, 
And so I was happy to have both things, but I couldn't have kept that up for a year in a rock company, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's how hard it was to do good theater, you know? And I finally just had to bite the bullet and say, you know, you're not in New York, and if somebody wants to call and ask you to come to New York and put you up somewhere while you do a show, that's fine, but otherwise, you know, you just can't do it much anymore. Mm-hmm. And I do, I do miss that a lot. I really do miss stage. Yeah. I mean, there's theater in L.A., but, like, nobody goes to see it. <laughs> well, you know, when there were those little theaters, that were, some of them were very good and successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, people were going to see it. I mean, you're talking 50 seats or something, you know. Yeah. Just that. Like, the Elephant Theater had some really good stuff going on, and a bunch of them. But then Equity did that thing where it made them pay us. And every, every actor will tell you, that it wasn't worth trying to get $25 a week or whatever they were trying to get for us. Mm. It wasn't worth it to put them out of business because they couldn't afford that. We wanted to do the work. We wanted agents and people to see us. Once in a while, the plane went to Broadway, you know? It, yeah. It was not, it was not very, uh, it was not in the best interest of actors to do what they did. They thought, oh, we're saving them from working for free, but really, truly, you know, whatever tiny bit they negotiated to get wasn't going to save us. And we all knew that when you did a play, you were working for free. And we just wanted to be able to work. Yeah. So that's disappointing that that happened. And then, of course, there was the, um, you know, the sag after a, uh, you know, uh, merging. Yes. That I didn't feel as much. Um, I do some... After work, I had, it just happened right after I had uh, recorded a book for um, big publishing company, I'm trying to think what it is, uh, you would know right away, but I can't think of the name of it. Um, anyway, I, I had just recorded a book and, and they were asking me, did I want the, did I want the money to come from SAG, from AFTRA or from SAG, and I said, I thought it would be AFTRA, I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, a voice saying, and they said, well, now we're merging, and they tried to explain the difference if I had it come from SAG or if I had it come, I was like, I don't know what any of this means, Random House is what I was trying to explain, mm-hmm. it kept being published by Random House, uh, so I still don't feel it very much, I guess most of my work has been SAG work, mm-hmm. you know, and my residuals all come through SAG, so I don't know, uh, I mean, I'd love to do some more books, and if that happens, that's great, that's an after thing, but now that they're put together, it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. Do, do, Have people expressed to you uh, any kind of uh, liking or disliking the merger? Oh, yeah, a couple of people I've talked to had told me that they don't like it because, you know, it's, it's not so much them. I mean, they, I mean, they've always been screwed over with getting residuals, but they just feel bad for the next generation of actors. Huh. I guess, you know, I'm not terribly savvy about it. Was it all actor people feeling that way or sad people or a mix? Uh, it was a mix. Yeah, I think that um, anything that keeps our union surviving is was a sacrifice. That's what I feel. Because once I remember the big, big issue for me in my career was when all the cable uh, stations started. Yeah. Just started. And now, look at they've just taken over the mainstream television. <laughs> and, and, you know, I can't, I can't regret it because the, the viewing options are so risky. But, you know, that, that really shut things up once cable turned out to be something big because SAG had negotiated a pretty minimalist uh, demand on the cable stations. I mean, they did not get it, what was going to happen. So they didn't get us very good fees or very good residuals or anything from all of that. And that was a, that was a big loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and another thing, too, that they were upset about too you know a lot of roles nowadays are non-union 
and they they're, they're so old school. They they were like you know you're you're not an actor unless you're you're a member of, of the guild, and it's like you know what it's, when you did your first movie, I mean, were were you a member of SAG, so you, you have no right to say that someone's not an actor if they're if they're not a, a member Certainly of the Certainly not. Certainly not. Yeah. So, like, you know, just, that's that's what their attitude is about that, you know, and it's like, you know, it's just, times have changed, and, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do to go with the times now, you know? I suspect that's always been true for actors, that they had to do what they had to do to eat. You know, I mean, it's never been a tremendously stable profession. Um, just like in sports, the people that are top of the game are millionaires many times over, and a lot of other people are sitting on a bench waiting to be chosen or waiting to be allowed to play or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, waiting to see if they'll be kept or dropped. So, you know, there's this can do and uh, sometimes I look back and I think, wow, I, I can't believe I actually made my way through that for all those years. Because I said when I was a teenager, I, I want to I be an actress. Um, I don't want to work for a boss and, you know, be, be retired at 60 with a watch. I, w I don't want to work for someone. And I want to have a daughter. And the other day I looked back and I thought, well, damn, I did it all. I became an actress and I made my own way and I made my own living and I had a daughter. And I thought, you know, you need to stop and congratulate yourself. <laughs> you set that vision at like 18 or 17 and you made it. Because really, really when I think about earning my own way for all those years, yeah. Uh, I mean, that sounds totally daunting. If I thought about it, I probably would have changed my mind. But it was just my instinct that I knew what work I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be freer than, you know, going to an office nine to five plus. As an actress, you can't really do that. Yeah. You have to be available for auditions, and then you have to be available for doing the job. And I couldn't see how I could be an actress and be locked into a nine to five thing. And that's why I started commercials when I first went to New York was to support me until I got some work. Mm -hmm. And I did those pretty much all through my New York stuff. I, I tried a little bit here, but I, I just didn't have as big a success and I wasn't as enthusiastic. So I was able to make money in other ways. And also by that time I started my coaching and teaching career and, and that really replaced the commercials for me. And I really love being an acting coach. I love it. Yeah. Do you, do you, um, so, do, so do you, do you teach like privately or do you do it in like a, a, an acting school? I'm not part of a school. Uh, I teach private lessons and I also teach group lessons. My, my uh, beginner group has all gone on and it was successful. So I disbanded it. And sometimes beginners come and I say, you know, Really, I don't have a class. If you want to start coaching, and then when you're ready, we can put you in the master class. That's possible. But I, I just, really, all my beginners became <laughs> successful. So that was really, that's a cool thing to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, have you coached anybody that's gone on to become successful? Oh, yeah. I've been uh, Marissa Tomei's coach for 35 years. Really? Yeah. Oh, you did a great job with her. I love her. Thank you. I love her, too. She's, she's really unique, and she, her talent is very, uh, both very conscientious. She really works as an actor. She does her homework. She asks the questions. She works on her lines. She's, like, very, you know, a mm -hmm. tremendous professional person. And she's really creative. Her ideas are, are deeper and more layers than a lot of people, but she's been a, a treat now, of course, with your friends after 35 years in this, but <laughs> it was really great. She came to my class, uh, I think someone found her in the, in the BU, Boston University lunchroom or something, and put her on a soap, which she really did not enjoy, 
And then she left that and came out, and someone directed her to me, and that the rest is history. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've been a, I've been the stage actor and a stand-up comedian for years. Um, uh, stand-up, I roll my hat is off to you. That's so great. Oh, it's, that's a lot of work, I'll tell you, but it's very rewarding. It's been one of the greatest things that's happened to me. And I'm just now getting into movie acting and stuff. I did a, a, a movie last year that hasn't been released yet, and then um, I just auditioned for something that I hope I get because I'm going to be working with many people that I just love. Oh, I hope you get it, too. I'll send you good energy for it. Listen, I need to go. Because it's been a while, and um, I have to get ready. I told you I had a dental appointment coming up. Oh, that's right. I'm so sorry I've kept you this long. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. I, uh, I'm giving you my time because I'm enjoying talking to you. I really appreciate oh. the interest, and I really appreciate the, how well informed you are. And oh, wish you. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, I, I wish you well. I appreciate your interest. I hope that this has been uh, what you needed. It certainly has, Kate. Uh, I'd love to talk to you again um, if, if, if you'd like to in the, in the future. Absolutely. If I have anything that you're interested in hearing, I'm always glad to talk to you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Kate, you have yourself a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and I will talk to you again. Same to you. Blessings. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Kate McGregor-Stewart. Ain't she a sweetheart? Thank you so much, Kate. You are such a, a sweet lady, and you're very insightful and full of wisdom, and I just loved talking to you and hearing about your days as a New York actress and, and all the triumphs and adversities that you've had in the business. If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.